You ever meet someone who has a powerful yet quiet impact on the world around them? Well, I have a friend of mine who is that individual. His name is Jason Atkinson. He is a filmmaker, a writer, uh, a speaker, and a public servant. Uh, after 14 years in the Oregon legislature uh, as both a state senator and the House serving in the House of Representatives, he took a sabbatical to make a film entitled A River Between Us. Uh, it's a river. It's a movie that documents the largest restoration project in U.S. history, uh, the Klamath River, uh, in which the Native American community, the government, uh, the farmers all had to figure out how to work together to save this river. It's become, in many respects, his life's work. Um, and Atkinson has uh, been so effective and so involved in this restoration negotiations, going back to the Clinton administration, that has now culminated in a victory uh, under the president, under President Obama's administration, with the final um, uh, decision in 2022, just a year ago, uh, being penned by FERC. Uh, he was recently named. Uh, in the top 20 most influential fishermen in the West uh, and uh, in field and stream. Uh, and they named him one of their heroes of conservation. But he's also got this other project uh, called Pastors Monday, in which he creates a refuge around fly fishing for pastors, which is growing. Started out with one pastor, is now serving over 300 pastors every Monday. Uh, and it's coming east. So we want to talk about how someone of service continues to give and profoundly impact not just their community, but the country. We're going to have our conversation with Jason Atkinson right after this on the Michael Steele podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. I'm Michael Steele. And as I noted uh, coming in, uh, this is a particular treat for me to uh, invite uh, to the room and have a conversation with a friend um, uh, going on now, what, almost 20 years. Uh, we've been we've been in the room together, Jason. <laughs> uh and 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 turning over furniture and and uh making a lot of noise but it's welcome man it's it's so good to have you here to talk about some of the work that you've been doing um and and sort of you know for me it's it's really kind of bringing to this audience uh real life experiences and what people are doing out there that they may not know about that are having a real impact on people um and so you're you're doing that, man, and I'm I'm proud of you, and it's it's, it's, it's you. wonderful to be able to showcase the work. Well, I'm happy to be here, Steele, and and the audience should know. I know this is a podcast, but um, we we do know enough about each other to to really have one on each other and keep everything honest. But yeah. um, yes. <laughs> I in my living room is a picture of you and I and Robin and Karen dressed up in Shakespearean clothing. Yeah. It's framed in my in my <laughs> my living room. So, <laughs> and, so and fortunately fortunately the audience can't see that, but, right, but I, right. I laugh every time I see it. Yes. Yeah. Well you know like I said folks, we were we you know we had a lot of fun over the years. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. Um so let's start let's start with um an earlier project that has been met with an enormous amount of success. Um, and that is when you decided to go out and, and, and push the largest restoration project in U.S. history. I mean, uh, people understand what this one guy did from his perch in Oregon um, in getting focus and attention played to uh, the Klamath uh, River um, and the documentary film that you did um, touching on environmental themes, um, our responsibility as citizens to the planet, 
tell us a little bit about that journey uh, coming out of, you know, the state legislature, campaigning for office to then make that pivot of 180 degrees to do something that most people wouldn't think a Republican would even care about. <laughs> <laughs> you and I know what we do, <laughs> right? But the story there were a lot of head, headwinds there. Yeah, it's it's actually there's still headwinds. Um, but the, the story of the Klamath River is the Klamath is the is the longest running water war in American history. And um, my family has now been on the river this year, 93 years. Right. So we are, um, as a white family, we're old. As a native neighbor, we're, we're, we're still pretty new. But um, that river um, is just part of the fabric, really, of who I am. And I was given this charge by, really, by my grandparents to fix it back to what it was. And one of my, my grandmother was a, was a very liberal Reagan hating Democrat. <laughs> and my grandfather was the opposite. Um, but on this, they did agree. And so I was in office um, in Northern California. Uh, I was known as, and still am known as Tom's grandson, even though he's been gone since 98. And then in the upper river, on the Oregon side, I was known as Senator Atkinson, but Republicans can't mess around with this kind of stuff, as you know. Right. Uh, that's against the credo. So um, I started way back in the Clinton administration, being involved, just seeing seeing how my newfound office could be helpful, but doing it behind the scenes. 2000, um, we had this huge mess uh, when the EPA, or excuse me, when the uh, uh, Fish and Game called in on the environmental, uh, the ESA, Endangered Species Act, and shut off the water for farmers, which was akin to what happened in 1973 for the Yurok Indians. There was suicides, there was bankruptcies, there was protests, there was almost everything that we see today in politics was, was there. And it was, and it was horrible. And Bush then uh, vowed, and, and as, as you and I mm -hmm. uh, both have the, the same friends, um, I was able to become more than acquainted with the president. And uh, he had vowed that, that this was going to be part of his of solving this problem. Then 9-11 happened. And uh, then everything's really slowed down. At the end of his session, or at the end of his second term, uh, Republicans threw him away and they said he was no longer conservative and he was no longer this and that as Republicans seem to do to each other. Right. Uh, as people don't even remember it now, but it was based on the bailout of the auto industry. But uh, through a lot of work, uh, again, behind the scenes, we were able to get George uh, W. Bush to, to ink the framework of the deal. I had run for governor. I had lost the guy who became governor uh, and I became friends on this issue, Ted Kulangoski. And the framework that W set up was then inked by Schwarzenegger, then the California governor and Kulangoski. So I thought it was done. It was great. They signed. The, here's the pins. I, I'm pointing in my office. Right. Two pins that they signed. They hand the pins to this little five year old and a clip on tie. My son, who's now 20. And uh, I thought the deal was done. Um, Republicans at that point, I, I love public service. It's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, uh, but I was also going broke in the legislature <laughs> and, um, um, I was at this really difficult time of trying to figure out if I was going to stay, uh, or, or take a, what I would, what I thought would be a sabbatical. This terrible movie came out, um, uh there was it's a, it's a movie it wasn't technically very good but it was interesting and it grabbed a hold of the nation called supersize me and this movie was really interesting because at the time there was all these lobbyists in 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 dc that were trying to shut down kids from eating fast food yeah that's right i remember that yeah. and then there was the big ag log lobby that was trying to kill it this guy makes a movie and a week later uh a week after the movie coming out mcdonald's pulls supersize from their menu Yep. So film and culture led politics. And so I got the idea of what happened. And um, on a cocktail napkin, it's the second cocktail napkin of the story, I sketched out what became this big film 
that took five years to make called The River Between Us. And that film was used to legitimize the audience or legitimize the issue before uh, East Coast audiences. And uh, at the same time that was going, um, I was working behind the scenes to work around Congress to get the framework of the deal set up for Obama to bless. That framework started on the first cocktail napkin back in 2004, mm -hmm. actually in the Cannon House office building down in the bowels of Congress. And we came up with this idea and that idea and that framework and all that work was finally blessed uh, by FERC last November. And um, and we won. And yeah. so there's Gavin Newsom signing. There's Governor Brown signing. There's the Interior Secretary signing. And I had thought about it. I have taken my son to meet seven different governors in the course of all of these 30 years of working on this. So the old adage is true. You can accomplish anything if you give all the credit away. Right. And really, uh, that's what we did. Now it's the largest uh, restoration project in American history. You you noted um, several times throughout this, and, and really one of the drivers behind the movie was this idea that if you heal people, they will heal the river. Yeah. What what is that? What's the story behind that? Politics is all about politics is all about dividing people with fear. And this particular place on planet Earth has been divided by fear since 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 forever. Mm -hmm. It's the only river. If you if you think about a community of interest, it's the only river where the top of the river has zero connection to the bottom of the river. The kids play in different sports leagues. It's very big, of course. So give us a sense uh, of where the river runs real quick. So it starts in it starts in southwest and southeastern Oregon. Uh -huh. It flows all the way into Northern California and pops through to the Pacific Ocean. It goes through the territory of five historic tribes, three of which are are right on the river. And it goes, it starts in what would be called today MAGA country and ends down by the golden triangle of, of all the <laughs> marijuana growers. Right, right. So its politics could not be more diverse. Um, the county politics are different. The state politics are different. The Oregon side gets all of the political headwind and California, honestly, has struggled to even know that this river's in their state over the years. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's huge geographically, but in the course of, of working through all of these, and, and obviously when we're making the film, it's a period of discovery. Of course, I know it, or I thought I knew it, but I came to this notion that if you, if you, if you heal these people and the mistrust that the people have with each other, both the right and the left, uh, the Native American and the farmer. Um, if you heal that, the, the the health of the river comes back uh, actually without government. Right, it comes right. back pretty quick, and um, and so that was the underlying message. And and then you also get back to you know to 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 the to the whole you know the one phrase the Beatitudes I think is so powerful. Blessed is are the peacemakers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we don't have very many of those today. Uh, politics chases those people out. But on this one thing, um, these people are all connected by water. And that water uh, is, is really, it's it's healing. And what so did you that's, discover, how, that's how it came from. What did you discover about the history of those of the Native American tribes uh, who live along this river and and their their stories as part of not just the history of the river but in terms of getting the 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 changes that you were seeking done well i think you know on one hand i was prejudiced to the fact that i thought i knew because i had grown up there and there's one thing to 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 be as a young kid to learn how tribal decision making happens, which most with white culture really doesn't understand the power of consensus, the power of of eldership. Those those are very important things. And in mm -hmm. America, you know, in, in in politics, we're just let's make a deal. You know, it's very right. transactional. Very transactional. And, yeah. And and in in native culture, it's very relational. 
And so they've been burned for hundreds of years of, of white guys coming in with a, with a new great idea for them. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the thing that was really just at the core that I, that I really understood better having gone through all this is, is, is just generational pain that uh that 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 several of the tribes have um and and it boils down to to something that i think that every human being wants that they don't ever get and every human being wants to be respected mm -hmm. and uh the tribes rarely get and members of the tribe rarely get respect um, it's fascinating to me that the history is largely men uh, and men in the tribes fighting, uh, fighting white culture. Today, it's fascinating that the strongest leaders in, in, in not only the Klamath and the Karuk, but also in the Yurok tribe are women. Mm -hmm. and I think that's really, that's Different really, conversation, isn't it? really <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. And, and. So, so what was their response you know, you, to you? What was their response to you coming in with this idea uh, to put in place um, and correct uh, the history, um, a, a strategy to heal the river? Well, that's that's actually two questions. I think coming in to do a film and to work on the river, I, I was fortunate um, that I, I wasn't an outsider. I wasn't some other guy right. you know, from the city or from an environmental group or from a political party that's got an idea to do something. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm there. Right. So, oh, you're, you know, it's, I'm, I'm one degree of separation from somebody figuring out who I was. So I, I started with a, with, with, with some legitimacy. I think, I think as far as the, the, the structure of the deal that we put together, I still had to maintain being being uh behind the shadows just a little bit in order to get things through and and that's more even today i think i think how i'm perceived on this whole thing is really a switzerland if you tell me a secret it's going to stay a secret mm -hmm. and um, you know there's a lot of uh there's, there's just a lot of human beings and there's a lot of interest between the mouth of the river and the top of the river and the, and the tribal tribal interests and certainly with 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 the, the variety of, of irrigators and and people trying to get elected at county level so you know it's good to be switzerland but you know i'm um uh, it, it's it's it, if you're going to accomplish anything big of course you give the credit away but you also got to maintain those relationships and, right. and I, I think i had a leg up on that now that's good and it's interesting because how else does one pull together not just the strategy, but the actual execution of the largest restoration project in the in the nation's history, in the, involving, as you said, seven governors, two states, uh, you know, Native American tribes, um, well uh, worn um, and established white interests versus historical interest of 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 Native of tribesmen and women. Pulling all that together and sort of being the Switzerland in that, um, where where are things right now? How how is this well, progressing? The, 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 yeah, I, I, you know, the truth be told, steel. <laughs> um, nobody <laughs> still knows the whole. Nobody really knows the whole story, and um, and there's a lot of people now that the deal's done. There's a million people taking credit, which is fine. Um, but nobody knows about that night. Uh, and I'll, I'll forget it cause it was my birthday and I was very depressed and I was very sad and we had done all this work and I'm in DC and it's the, what was it? Like 10 30 or 11 at night. And our mutual big sister, Robin called you right. and me and Tom, who was in the administration and it was that is that that evening was probably one of the more pivotal evenings to getting the whole deal done. All right. And there wasn't a member of Congress there and there wasn't a member of the press there. There was four friends, actually, Robin uh, telling you and Tom 
you gotta help your little brother out right right and yeah and in um, that robin-esque way <laughs> yeah and then um you know nobody knows that part of the deal um and all the ngos couldn't know that people don't know that the 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 thursday we were supposed to get the deal excuse me or was it tuesday uh, it was thursday um right before thanksgiving three weeks after we were together um that at the, the concert at the Bataclan in paris when the terrorists came in and right. shot up all of those concert goers that stalled the deal from Obama by four months. Nobody knows that. Right. You know, so there's a whole unwritten part of it, which, which I, I think makes me sometimes, sometimes you kind of like people to know the whole story, but sometimes it's a really cool kept secret right. how, we, how, how it all happened. But where it sits today is, is FERC has inked the deal. So just not to not not to kill the whole podcast with this, but it was a three-way deal. Berkshire Hathaway would get rid of four dams in exchange for not getting sued. Uh, the dams would come down, and in exchange for an increase in uh, in in salmon and steelhead that the tribal want that the that the lower river and the upper river tribes would want, there would be some relief for farmers and farmers in exchange for the dams coming down. The dams, by the way, do nothing for agriculture. They right. don't store any water for agriculture, but in exchange for that, they would have a cap on their power rates and they would have a, a guaranteed floor of water to irrigate. Right now, as it stands, two of the three of those are made whole. Berkshire Hathaway is out. Uh, the dams are coming down. They'll start this year and they'll be finished in 24. The tribes largely have uh, will will get everything that they agreed mm -hmm. to, and for 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 a whole nother podcast, agriculture's gone, right? Not gone. Let me be specific. Agriculture does not have a floor of water, and they don't have their power rates capped, right? So their legislative uh, leaders at the time let them down, and um, now the, the biggest fear throughout what's going to happen in the next couple couple of years is is on ag. Right, right. But the, the, the there's the, really no reason for anybody to get hurt in this deal, but right. politics being what they are. Right. And 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 I think that's really uh, one of the things I found very fascinating about your story and, and why for me it was important to tell on, on, on a number of levels. But at this level, it was how despite the the obstacles from 9-11 to, you know, the Bataclan to um, the personalities involved, there is the river between us was in metaphorically you in one sense, connecting these sides um, and, and, and sort of bringing by force of personality and will uh, people to the table around this idea that this, this river is important culturally it's important politically, it's important economically, it's important for a whole environmentally, for a whole lot of reasons. And it stands as a symbol of how we work with each, with each other, or we don't. Mm -hmm. um, and and I and I found that fascinating, um a fascinating aspect of the film because you can tell and actually feel the tensions, particularly with the Native American, the lack of trust in the beginning, the lack of of being convinced that all of this is on on the up and up and legit uh and yet you were able to do that and here we are um watching this this story unfold real time uh with all of the various political interests and conflicts and histories of of lies and and distrust uh sort of dissipating being washed washed clean by by the deal mm -hmm. uh and ultimately by the river um so it for me it it does speak that to this this sense that in these times we can still get big things done when we all want to get them done and that there are men and women willing to as you said 
not give a damn about where the credit lands, but care more about getting it done. I, I think you're right. I, I, I these, these, this, this whole community is these people are just absolutely beautiful and they're fascinating and they're complicated and to look from the outside you you, you wouldn't see that um you know you, you'd quickly judge them as as rural and too uh you know and you, you put these people into these silos but these tribes are extremely different and they have right. extremely different interests um these uh, folks in agriculture are very different and they have very different interests but through through just uh, th there's a certain beauty in the fact that they're connected forcibly by this this system of water right <laughs> and, and um and they make it whole and i think you know america that's it's really is what's the very best in america um it really is you know that the, the the notion of being your brother's keeper is really true um it's 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 um i i think this is the most beautiful one of the more beautiful stories in american history so i'm i'm plat you know extremely grateful to play well, you're one of the authors of that story but 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 the thing that the thing that's cool that someday we should confess is uh what happened that night in that omni shoreham hotel <laughs> yes well yes <laughs> It moved the president of the United States. I think it was pretty cool, but <laughs> no, it's it's it, it's all good. It's all good. Um, but as I said, you you're you're one of the <laughs> authors of that story. Um, but what is fascinating about you and the stories you're writing? You're also writing another story, which I want to get into with sure. you. Sure. Um, as as um the um the Oregon Way, st Substack put it in writing about this new chapter in your life they said as a boy jason atkinson was uh would go to church twice a week and go fishing five times a week decades later he's still devoted to his christian faith and remains what, what are you reading from about fly fishing what We're, what what is what are you reading from ah yes i have my sources what you talking what about what source are these i didn't author this I, I, well, it, it, it's a story written about Pastor's Monday, which we're going to talk kidding? about. Which we're going to talk about right after this. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele Podcast. We've been having this wonderful conversation with my friend Jason Atkinson, who has who was instrumental in pulling off uh, and getting in motion one of the largest, the largest um, restoration uh, project in U.S. history along the Klamath River. Uh, running from Oregon to Northern California, um, and, and so now, Jason, I want I want to flip the script and talk about um, your walk in faith uh, and how that has translated into this novel concept um, called Pastors Monday, um, in which you basically gather pastors. And just for folks to know, most priests, ministers, iman, religious leaders take Monday off. That's their that's their weekend. Um, uh, I know growing up and even to this day, the the priest in my parish Monday, they're generally not at the rectory. They're you know, they take the downtime, the me time. Mm -hmm. You have come up with this concept um, going back to the pandemic, uh, the pandemic year 2020 of creating this outlet for pastors to, to go fly fishing. Uh, tell us about this and and what it's doing and how it's working because it is it is phenomenally popular. It is growing like wildfire um, among pastors, not just in Oregon where this began, but now seemingly across the country. Well, yeah, thank you, and I'm I'm still uh, a little bit in shock about your sources and your research there, <laughs> um, but. Yeah, Pastors Monday, it was a concept that really came out of uh, kind of out of a, a, a lot of pain. Um, but as you and I both know, um, when you're in politics, you know everybody. Right. But you have no friends. Yes. And, so um, true. <laughs> and so true. your phone never rings with good news. Your phone only rings with bad news and people wanting something from you. And 
Um, if you think about the role of a pastor, it's the exact same thing. They know everybody. They have no friends. And who can they talk to? Uh, who can they uh, relate to? Well, they can't really relate to anybody in their church and certainly not anybody in the leadership of their church because the people in their church are looking to them as, you know, spiritual perfection. <laughs> And people who, you know, work in their church are complaining about, should we wear masks to church? Should we have a new parking lot? What about the kids? The music's too loud or, or whatever. Right. So um, I had a real sensitivity to, to, to pastors. So behind, behind my uh, side story, behind my, uh, there's a handwritten note here uh, from the president of the United States thanking me for a fly rod that I gave him. And um, I gave the president this custom fly rod that I, for a company I was helping to develop fly rods for, and he loved it. And every time he saw me, he wanted to talk about it. When we started Pastor Monday, people like, people said, well, we've got this old thing in the garage that we've never used. And it was our grandfather's. Would you like it for, for the pastors? And people were very generous and, you know, cause we were a startup and I had no money to do all this, but I was so convicted Steele. I was so convicted because I thought about it for just you know, for a while. And I'm like, so the president of the United States who gets all the press, who gets the very best that the country has to offer, who has a bigger impact in every community? All right. The president or the pastor of 50 people? And I was so convicted by that because um, you know, of course, you know, if you turn on the news, you hear about the mega pastor or you hear about a screw up or you hear something that kind of makes you cringe a little bit. But the tr fact of the matter is, is that pastors as a group um, are the most important overlooked leader in every community. There is no issue facing culture that they don't have to have an opinion on or make a decision about. Mm -hmm. um and yet um we know that the burnout rate and there's a lot of statistics on this right now 42 percent of people who are in ministry want to quit especially after the pandemic i had no idea how big the suicide rate was mm -hmm. um i had no idea the lone well actually i did have an idea but you know certainly learn more about the loneliness that these leaders face and if there's an issue before a group of people, I don't care if it's AA or, or senior citizens or kids that need to go to camp, but certainly the spiritual needs of a community, <clears throat> it all falls on this one person who is solely unprepared for all of these issues. Right, right. I mean, you and I went to school for this stuff. You know, right. you and I have got, we interned, we, we've been around politics. We know it inside and out. But a pastor, you know, maybe they went to, you know, seminary, maybe. That doesn't mean they know understand all this other stuff. Right. This pressure. So we started this thing um, to just as an ex actually there's a, 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 a I've been um, involved in fly fishing more than I'd ever admit my whole life. And uh, have developed somewhat of a reputation, which is a little awkward and, and and yet flattering. And there was this person who wanted to learn how to do this kind of cast that I do, which is a two-handed fly rod. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to learn how to do this. And he had Monday and I, he said, how about Monday? And I really didn't want to be around. I didn't, I was kind of trying to get away. When I go to the river, I don't want to be around people. Uh, <laughs> he was persistent. And um uh, and we had to go on Monday because he was a pastor of a, of a church. And uh, so it turned into this joke be that I have to fish the pastor on Monday. Well, I really ended up enjoying this person's company a lot. And uh, we went the next Monday and the next Monday and the next Monday. And eventually um, I, I was challenged by, well, what happens if I add, add another pastor? And and then uh, we formalized it. We set up a 501c3 and we did all that. Last year, over five, over 300 pastors came between Oregon and North Texas. Wow. Uh, in two months, we opened North Carolina. And what it is, is we serve the pastor as if they're the president of the United States. 
So back to what we're talking about in the first segment, there's no sarcasm, no sarcasm. Right. We treat the pastor with absolute respect. Um, there is no program. We're not we're not forcing anybody into a conversation where they right. have to be authentic and transparent. Maybe they don't want to talk. Fine with us. Maybe they do. It's up to them. It's their day. We're just there to serve. So we we curate the finest fly fishing experience you can have, but we don't orchestrate. We leave that part up to the Almighty to orchestrate who needs to be there. We had uh, forest fires come through this one pastor let's just say of a blue collar church 12 families in his church lost everything friday yeah. night the next uh monday he seated next to a pastor of a white collar church different denomination 20 years his junior totally different same league different teams by the time they get off together on pastor monday families have houses again mm -hmm. that happens every every monday we had a pastor whose 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 wife passed away from cancer he found a support group in these other pastors because they right. speak the same language we had a pastor whose son got mixed up in drugs well who does he talk to right. well he happened to be seated next to somebody who's you know 10 years further down the road on that issue and now is is, is a friend so it, it it just keeps happening. Uh, why fly fishing? Well, it's simple. Um, you know, God never called golfers. <laughs> uh, uh, let me write that 90. down because I could not agree more with that sentiment. <laughs> so, so there's fly fishing is uh, it's beautiful. It's aspirational, uh, but it's cost prohibitive. It's expensive. And right. So we take that away. Uh, we, we, we give away when you go with, when a pastor comes with us, they're in the finest waiters they're with the finest rods. They're with the very best guides, the very, the very best, highest level of guiding is what we provide. Even though 95% of those who come with us have never done it before. They don't know the standard that we're, we're providing, but we do. Right. And it's up to us to do all things, you know, the best of our ability. So, so we, uh, we serve. And, uh, you know, as as a former on. as a former seminarian, I I really do appreciate uh, that that outlet being created for these men and women who who give their their service um, in such a unique and personal way because a lot of people don't don't really consider what the priest or the pastor, the imam or the rabbi have to go through, uh, whether they're celibate or married, um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The, the, the tensions, the pressures are the same. And so who serves them? Who is allowing for them to be frail and to be human and to be uh, vulnerable um, in a way that is healing so that they can then go out and, and, and do that for others? And that's when you first told me about this, uh, I immediately got it. As you may recall, I was, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I was like all about it. And um, because it, it is one of those areas of our lives that we take a lot of it for granted, or we don't know anything about it at all. And, and those men and women in that position, um, really don't have that outlet and and as you as you like to joke you know you want to take these fishes of men and teach them to be fishers of fish <laughs> and, and there's and there's something really basic and honest about that you know it, it's uh, this growth that you're now beginning to see what does that tell you about where we are culturally and and so forth and and how these pastors are sort of dealing with and evolving um, in this this new space where, like you, as you set this up, you know, they're sitting there having one parishioner say to them, you know, why are we having to wear masks? And another parishioner says, I'm not coming back to church until you do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I what, think, what, I think, how, how uh, do they walk that line? Culturally, I think we're at, a, we're at this 
this really interesting inflection point in culture where where a lot of uh, a lot of American churches are reflecting culture rather than leading culture. And our culture today is very divided, you know, and there's there's this constant thing that we do, especially Republicans in particular, where you're not enough of something. You're not conservative enough. You're not enough of whatever. And I think I think that same pressure is translated into uh, these leaders also. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're even on Sunday, I think it was Martin Luther King. I should mm-hmm. know that it's Martin Luther King who said, you know, you know the most segregated time in America is, yeah. you know, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning. And we, we still have that. So I think um, I think there's a tremendous amount of pressure. I think there's a tremendous amount of burnout. I, I am shocked uh, with the suicide rate. I am shocked with with the loneliness of, of leadership that uh, that these people uh, feel. But the demand has outstripped the supply. So there's a lot of things out there where, you know, uh, let's take care of the pastor and they can go somewhere for a week. Well, what happens the other 51 weeks? Right. So our model, um, pastors don't have time to take off for a week and they don't have money. If they did have time, they wouldn't have, you know, $3,000, $4,000. So what we do is we go every Monday. So it's very easy. It's supposed to be local. So there's not airplanes involved. That's why the chapters are getting set up around the country. They might drive an hour or two, but, um, and we limit it. We limit it in, in, in uh, how many can go. So it's not a conference. You know, it's interesting, uh steel you and i used to go to these things and we we would be the speaker right Right. so you and i were always on stage we were always the speaker but what happens if you're not the speaker you go to a conference and you're not then then the first thing you do is you start saying either i want to be the speaker i want to be on stage i want to be famous or what's wrong with me that i'm not on the stage and i'm not famous right so you take these pastors and you put them in a conference and they actually leave worse than they they feel worse after than than right. <laughs> before they went. And so we treat everyone, everyone who comes with us as if they are the president of the United States. We treat them the utmost respect and honor. And, and then you're doing something ridiculous. You're, you're, you're throwing wads of chicken feathers known as flies uh-huh. at fish. It could not be more simple, but it's beautiful. There's no noise your cell phone is off and you're, you're actually being treated with respect. And, and the thing is, is that the demand keeps growing because pastors don't have that. And they've, they've kind of always wanted to do it. Uh, but the fly fishing part of it is beautiful and gorgeous as that is. And as much as that's a fabric of my life, that's not why they keep coming. Right. The, the, the fly fishing part of it is fun and, but that's not why they're coming. That's certainly not why they're coming back. Right. They're coming because of what I just said. The, the, the first time a pastor comes with us, they wait about 20 minutes for the ask. You know, they're waiting for us to ask them for, for money or they're waiting for them to ask them to sign up for something, to be in some group. Nope. There's no ask. And they're shocked. They're right. absolutely shocked that there's no ask. And so it's it's a tremendous amount of fun. I don't know how uh, right now we're, you know, we I'm trying to raise money for this, um, right. which is hard because the concept is so simple. Somebody, you know, it's so simple. It's <laughs> What's the catch? Fun. Yeah, people, are, same thing. What's the program? What's the program? Uh, it's no, kind of like a take, Seinfeld issue. You know, it's about fly fitching. Fly yeah, fishing, that's it. It's, it's like Seinfeld, you know? I mean, it's a show about, you know, what? There's nothing? All right. No, really, it's it's exactly what I just said. But so we're trying to we will. There, there's two things that hold us back, um, which are which is which is raising enough money. Obviously, doesn't even cost that much. This really doesn't cost. But I, I, you have to have development money to make it work. And then second one is talent. I don't need guides. I need people who are going to serve. Right. I don't. I don't need you know dude bros high five and what i need is somebody that's sensitive enough to take care of the priest to take care of the pastor right and to serve them for eight hours on a monday um 
but the numbers, not that you would, not that the numbers are not important, but let me tell you how the numbers work. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because when you write, when you're trying to get philanthropy interested, they go, how do you measure success? Well, you know, I think, I think, I, I think between forest fires and friendship and, and support and homelessness and the things that happen on the boat is success, but you can't quantitate that. So you quantitate it. If you look at, we did 300 pastors and you multiply 300 pastors by the average church size, even small, we're starting to get to half a million. We're, we're starting to strengthen the leaders of about a half million Americans. If we get to eight chapters around the country, and very conservatively, we're influencing the leaders of close to two million people. And those two million people are never going to thank us. They're never going to know we're out there. Right. But we but we have given their leader connection. We have given their leader community. We have given their leader support. We have given their leader respect we very well may be the reason why these people don't burn out and why they stay there and keep serving. So we can have through fly fishing pastors Monday, we can have a huge impact on the country. So folks, if you want to know more about this work and, and be supportive of it, uh, go to www.pastorsmonday.com. Very straightforward, very simple. That's it. Um, and you know, as I like to say, help a brother out, help a brother who's <laughs> trying to help a brother, right? Help a brother who's trying to help a brother. Um, and, and again, learn a little bit more about it because it is, like I said, I was just blown away from the very beginning by the concept, um, just because of my own sort of unique background and history in relation to pastors. Um, and I know everything that Jason's been saying about them is true. Uh, these are, these are, you know, men and women with frailties, uh, and, and all the, all the crap that life puts on us all, but they, they are called in a different way. And so anything in any time we can support them, uh, and give them the space to, to refresh and to renew, uh, it's always a good thing. So Pastors Monday is one one of those uh, unique ways. It, as Jason says, that was fly fishing, but it's more than that. Uh, as you've heard, it, it's a little bit more than that, um, and it's a chance for for the kind of renewal that we are all going to want to need uh, our leaders to have. <laughs> we're, we're we're in that confessional, or we're standing there going. Passer, I got a problem. Uh, you want them to look at you and go, you know, let, let's have a conversation. Not, not, uh, you know, your problem is no worse than mine. <laughs> so does that mean, does that mean, Steele, that you're going to finally come out and uh, join one of these? Yes. No, I, I want to do that. I absolutely want to do that. That's, that's on my bucket list for this year. Um, to it's come really out. fun. It's, and you know, where you, else can you, you and I've been trying to do the fly fishing. You've been trying to teach me fly fishing for how long we've been together now, right? Well, so look, man. Um, so 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 here's so I got. I'll I'll tell you something to the audience that that is this funny. So so Michael Steele <laughs> is one of my just you you and I, this 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 is this is both true and honest and heartfelt. I mean, you you truly make my life better. Nah, being a friend of yours and you, uh, I, I love you and years ago i was working in northern iraq in kurdistan yep and i'm setting up this leader to leader exchange program and we're doing all this stuff um some of our work still is on uh 60 minutes um mm -hmm. the gold star work yeah and uh so so i get this opportunity to take um some dignitary types well i'm not going to take any dignitaries i'm going to call my friends so i call up <laughs> michael and i'm like hey on such and such day uh i'm going to be in dc and then then we're going to go to um, amman jordan and then in the middle of the night we're going to fly into kurdistan it's going to be great i've got security don't worry and you said like george Surrogood, uh i don't know man uh i gotta go ask my wife <laughs> i'm like you got 12 hours 
<laughs> so do you remember this? Yes. So the I next do. day, yes. so the next day I call you and I'm like, hey, we're going. Uh, I need your, you know, your your digits for the for the for the for the t- the ticket. And he, you said, I don't know. My wife's a little concerned. I said, about what? <laughs> well, she's not concerned about zone. going to Iraq. She's concerned about going to Iraq with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's um, the best. No, we we we've had some fun, and and the beauty of it is we we've. I mean, through you, my association with you, we, I have been exposed to um, a, a whole lot of things that connect human beings and the work you've, you, you've done and, and still do in Kurdistan, um, the work you've done and doing here domestically is all about how we connect people. And and I just want to let people know that as a former elected official and and um, and political figure, you have not allowed the stain that oftentimes uh, envelops uh, those leaders uh, deter you from that good work. Uh, and you are such a good model and a good example of someone who not just br- brings to the political world the real life experiences of Native Americans, for example, but also moves in that space in a way in which you try to get those institutions and those political leaders to move on behalf of real people. Um, and that that work in our lifetime is not showcased enough. Um, because a lot of people begin to believe and, and think that there aren't angels out there. There aren't good Samaritans. There aren't people who actually give a damn about another human being. That it's all about, you know, what George Santos is pretending to be versus looking at the people who are real and doing real stuff. So um, I appreciate you taking time to come and share with us the story of the river um, and the story of the pastors um, that really are linked together uh, in so many in so many ways. And the central piece there is this white guy from Oregon named Jason. <laughs> oh, you, I love being called the white guy. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> no, but see, no, it's just guy, a good it's thing. Guy, it's just it's a, this guy named Jason who I can show you. I can show you me and you dressed up in Shakespearean clothing and ruined both of our careers. I know. Actually, I think mine's already destroyed. But you, no, you've got good. something going on. You're good. Uh, Jason Atkinson is is again just. Um, He's just one of a kind. Uh, he's a real he's a real guy doing real stuff that's having a real impact. And I appreciate you coming on the podcast to share a little bit of that story. Um, for folks, if you haven't had a chance to check out the film, it's called A River Between Us. It's a documentary. You can you can get it online Amazon and iTunes uh, on iTunes, uh, YouTube. Um, no, no, it's uh, that one is only on Amazon and oh, it's and, only on Amazon, right? Okay, yeah, YouTube. I mean, YouTube doesn't put my kid through college. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, and and uh, of course, uh, Pastors Monday, uh, go to www.pastorsmonday.com, check out the good work there. If you if you uh, want to be supportive, please do. Uh, if you know a pastor that you think uh, could benefit from this, uh, put him in touch with Jason and his team and and watch for expansion of this because it, it is growing. Um, as he said, uh, it's coming it's coming east uh, and we're happy for that. And and I'm happy for you, Jason. You, you are my brother, my friend. Uh, love you, man. And anytime I can be supportive of your efforts and your work, you just pick up the phone as you do and call. Thanks. Love you too, Steele. 
All right, friends. That does it for our conversation this time, man. Um, take care of yourselves out there. Don't forget to check us out on uh, Apple Podcasts, uh, where you get your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Michael Steele, the podcast at, at Steele underscore podcast. And, um, you know, be safe, be well. Check out the movie A River Between Us. Check out Pastors Monday. Uh, and check out Jason. Follow him on Twitter at Jason A. Atkinson, A-T-K-I-N-S-O-N. Actually, that one, I'm mostly on the gram now. You're mostly on the gram? Yeah. Okay. I don't, I'm not, my Twitter thing, I'm just, nobody cared on my Twitter. So All right, what's your, what's your Instagram? Same, Jason A. Atkinson. Two okay. A's. All right. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, still, I'm just not that cool. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't I don't think any of us are, but you just need to learn how to pretend, baby. That's what you yeah, do. I'll, I'll fake it till you. Wait a minute. No. Uh, yeah, I'm just not that cool. This is not that cool. Well, uh, <laughs> check him out. And until next time, folks, be well, be safe and God bless. <laughs> <laughs>